Welcome to the Darkest Timeline podcast with Joe McHale and Ken Jung, and we just want to start out by just saying we want to send all of our love, thoughts, and prayers to everyone affected uh, in Minneapolis right now with the current situation, and uh, it's uh, Friday afternoon as we're taping this specific time, and um, our thoughts and prayers go to, <clears throat> excuse me, all infected because uh, it's... Uh, I meant to say affected, but I guess infections on my mind because we still amidst a pandemic right now, and um, this is unspeakable. I, I can't even, you know, uh, it, it truly is the darkest timeline, and um, yeah. it, it yeah. just for all infected by uh, again keep saying infected, but it, all affected by this, uh, you know, um, you know, as a minority male and as a as someone in the United States that you know it doesn't matter what level of success um, anyone attains. Unfortunately, this country painfully reminds us at times. And as President Obama said, you know, just now, in 2020, things like this should not be happening. Things like this should not be happening. And, um, you know, I'm glad that the officer, um, the, the officer who, who knelt on George Floyd's neck is, is in custody and charged with third degree murder and manslaughter and I'm glad of that and um and and uh more things need to be sussed out especially with the other three officers involved but I I think right now we need to have some peace we need to have some inclusion we need a president who's not divisive and not instinctive and who is not more half cocked than a than a comic you know that's tweeting it it's ridiculous and to me we need leadership we need action and if it's not from up above, we need to be our own leaders right now. And that's what we're doing. You know, this is, you know, and I'm sure people listening right now will be saying, oh, you know, stick to your lane. Stick to your lane. Just do, you know, do what you're brought here to do. Okay, I was brought here as a doctor. I was brought here as a Korean-American male. I was brought here to lead because that is what we're doing. So that's my lane. So right now... We, I just, uh, this, the, as it's happening right now, and, and all of us have lost a lot of sleep, it's, I just, uh, I'm, I'm just beyond words of, to hap- for this to happen in the midst of a pandemic is unspeakable. And it's, the virus is still out there, guys, you know, and, and now to have this kind of situation, you know, it, it that's, it, I, I I can't even I can't even fathom that. So, so to me, uh, I don't know. As a father, uh, as a husband, and as a citizen, as a U.S. citizen who was born in the United States, this offends me. And we just need to get our shit together, and we yeah. just need to get our fucking shit together. And and I just want to lead off by that because unlike our president who just spoke just now who just talked about the WHO for some reason and left without answering any questions and even acknowledging the tragedy that's going on in Minneapolis incredible i felt it incumbent upon myself to be our own leaders and i, I just anyone listening right now just be your own leaders and you know this is what we all have to do is just be our own leaders and be the best version of ourselves right now because virus ain't going away hate and racism ain't going away and the only way to address all of this is to bring truth to power and uh and that's what this podcast was founded on that's what that's why we're here and um and joe get me off of this train please so (laughs) i couldn't agree with you more. I, no, you're right. And when, you know, like it's Obama said, like it's it's 2020, and you said it. We're in a pandemic. When does this stop? It seems to never. It's it's been. I mean, 400 years, and it's still going. And it is just disgusting when you see a guy, uh, seven minutes on his neck, which is not. I just heard the the former New York police chief going like, no one, that's not, he goes, maybe in a scuffle it happens, but that's not a, that's not a way to, the, no one is taught to restrain people that way. And that's a way to kill a person. And the guy, it says in his, uh, it's uh, with, depra- with depravity that he was, uh, that he's arrested under 
uh, third degree manslaughter and uh, murder. But it, because he was so pedestrian about the way he was well, this man who was dying underneath his knee. And um, I, you know, I you, to be a black person in this country and to fear when you get pulled over by a police officer or if you, for a traffic stop or something. And as a white man, you never had that fear. And I didn't realize that until until high school when uh, this guy in my high school told me that. And I was like, I just didn't even dawn on me. And if you get educated, read books like Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, read White Fragility uh, by Robin D'Angelo, read those books, get educated, and you will see that there is a systemic racism is alive and well in this country. And it's, we live in this great country. We all talk about it. And, but it is not, uh, if, if you're, if you're a person of color, it is, it is not the same. And it just needs, it just, it just starts with, uh, starts with the you getting educated and speaking out and there you go i wish i didn't uh, know so much about uh, about politics it, before trump i you know i was blissfully unaware of just the ma machinations of passing a bill through congress you know I, I was so naive about all of these things because we had people who who were smarter than me on both sides of the coin, who knew the Constitution, who knew law, who would accept some tenets of what this country was founded on, on the Constitution, and debate policy from there. You know, it was a very simple argument. It was if you're conservative or you're liberal. If you're conservative, you want to conserve money. You want to conserve your resources. If you're liberal, you want to spend money. You want to spend your resources to help the country. And both sides of the coin was all about helping the country, you know, for what they believed was good for the country. And then you have a president who doesn't understand that, who doesn't know it, who just defies it, who just it, – it, it goes beyond comprehension right now of what's going on. And there, there, there's no civility because there, there literally is no belief and no education. And that's why anyone listening to this right now, um, knowledge is power, man. Just the more you know, the more you can form your own opinions. And I'm not trying to – you know, I'm, I'm not trying to have everyone be on my side. They can disagree with anything. Yeah. I am, dude, I have friends on both sides of the coin. Dude, I do not talk about this stuff. This is not me. If no, you talked to don't. me we a year do. ago, I'm not oh, this shit. guy. I don't, and, and here's another thing. Online, I never engage. I'm only calling truth to power. Anyone who trolls me, you ain't going to get a response because to me in a pandemic situation, trolls are like patients. They may not like the medicine, but I know what's good for them and they, they can they can resist and they can bump on it. I won't be offended. You're not hurting me because right now it's not about it's not about my ego at this point. It's about what's right. And honestly, I wish that I, I didn't feel compelled to to speak out. And and but as a guy who practice medicine for seven years as a guy who had a practice had, had 2054 patients under my practice as an internal medicine doctor at kaiser i became partner at kaiser permanente that meant i was tenured couldn't get fired i got a partner at kaiser permanente in two years where it normally takes three i know what the fuck i'm talking about so right now there is malpractice going on and there is harm going on on so many levels and i wish i wouldn't even have to like you know, puff it out like that because I, you you want people that are smarter than me that are that would know how to handle this better than me. You you assume that's in government, but that's not the case. It's not the case. Like I know exactly what to do is to act fast, to test, test, test. I'm talking about a pandemic at least to test, yep. test, test. And if you don't have a treatment, if you don't have a vaccine, keep on testing fucking more. You know, so it, it's just simple fucking science if you don't know what it is we keep testing and finding out information it's that it's not that hard it's so not hard mm -hmm. and if you want to hear more details about that please listen to the last interview we had with daniel de kim thank him for coming on and sharing his yep. personal details for covid19 you know i and, still um, uh the way he talked about getting the virus was and his description of it is the most hair-raising uh, that i've heard
Yeah, I, I mean, mean that, you, you obviously you see it in there, but then to hear someone that you know go, oh my gosh, when he said fiberglass in his throat, I was just, I, and when he said it didn't even feel like the flu, that was just eye-opening. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and there's so much we still don't know about it. I mean, he's talking about other symptoms that are uncommon, and and um, it, it it's, there's just still so much we don't know about this virus. We, we don't, we, yeah. there's just so much we don't know. And, and it's not... And all that, all this, all that's being violated right now, because of this incredibly tragic social injustice. I, I can't even, I, I, I huh. and 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 it's not just it, it's not just it's L A. It's every city. It's every major mm-hmm. city where protests are going on. Everyone's affected. No, no, no one can just say that's just happening in Minneapolis. It's not happening where I live. But no, it's affecting every every major area right yeah. now so to me it affects all of us we're as in, we're as interconnected when one of us falls we all fall so we really you know leadership's really got to get their shit together man and just yeah. um again it's about right now making adjustments making the right decisions and making the right turns in 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 policy and to me i don't care who does it i'm not anti-trump because i'm anti-trump if trump comes up with a vaccine tomorrow if he comes up with a change of policy tomorrow if he acts really quick and just socially hammers it great i it, to me it's not about the i'm not playing politics i just want i just, i just this stuff needs to happen now it's not waiting till november whatever change yep. we have it just needs to happen now it just yeah. needs to happen now Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So anyway. Oh, so you didn't get any sleep. I didn't get. <laughs> <laughs> no, I slept. I slept twelve hours. <laughs> when was the last time you slept twelve hours? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh man, imagine um, that. It's just. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's so. quite a day. It is. Uh... Oh look, and it's one of my heroes. Great. Now one of my hey. heroes is. So. Hold on, my headphones haven't connected for some reason. Give me one second. Figure this out. Oh, man. Oh. Yeah. Well, that yeah. was our guest, Dave Batista. And, and that uh, was our guest. Was, Thanks for coming on. So you did a great job. I just thought, like, great. man, he just kind of, he talked about like himself, that. his backstory, <laughs> his beginnings as a bouncer. and a, Oh, and he's back I'm again sorry. for more. <laughs> and <laughs> if you're, you're back after the break, it's Dave Batista. Man. We had a. One and a half second interview with That's him. That's why he's now. the We're... animal. That's why he's the animal. He just came back from war. They've, uh, they were connected. I don't know what's going on. Can be... So I'm sorry. I have to. Can we hear you dude, loud we, and clear. We hear you loud you and clear. You probably can't hear us. Dude. No, fuck. All right. I'm sorry. I have to get, get off the screen so I can get these headphones set. Give me one second. <laughs> it's all good. We can hear you, Dave. Yeah. Again, you know that what? was. Dave can do that. what he wants. He was in depth. Dave Batista, was... if he wants to leave and then come back, he can do that. He's the animal, yeah. all right? You know, when he went into, Why are these uh, not? well, about about all his Marvel movies, uh, that was amazing. And his transition into, you know, everything from romantic comedy to kid stuff. It's just... I think it's the best interview we've ever done, Joel. And I'm not just saying that because I'm intimidated by Dave. And I'm not just saying that because he's bigger than all of us combined. Best interview we've done. Hey, Dave. Hey, sir. Right. That was great. I'm that was a great so interview, so sir. I'm um, already getting shit from Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not that we're intimidated by you, sir. That was the best interview we've done. No notes. It was no wonderful. Notes. We, if there's, if there's was, anything you want to edit out. Anything Dave, you want to edit out? You, anything you want to say else say. additionally, you know? <laughs> I literally started sweating so bad just from that that I fogged up my glasses. <laughs> He probably did a three and a half hour workout and oh, man. couldn't uh, and but then this yes, of course, technology is the most stressful <laughs> thing that's ever It's uh, so good high. to see you, buddy. It's so good to yeah, see you, man. You. It really is, dude. And yeah. uh, it's an honor to meet you. Yes. I will tell you that. I like what I've been like thank you guys. Thanks for having me, man. It's... Are you kidding? we we were just talking about see <laughs> We'll, we'll 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 go we'll go backwards to Dave and, and his and his history later. But um, lately, you and I have been texting and and tweeting and retweeting each other, you know, about all the things that are going on in the pandemic and now with Minneapolis. Yeah. And we were just talking about that just now for uh, for a good ten minutes. And uh, I just yeah. want to thank you, Dave, 
for bringing truth to power. You are just a no bullshit guy who just speaks your mind without yeah. fear. And you're just and I saw your Instagram video um, a couple of days ago and it moved me to tears, man, because you're just speaking truth to power. And honestly, your your fearlessness helps make me feel less scared. You know, you you are you know, I'm not saying you're my bodyguard or anything, but you, you, your fearlessness is making me feel like just, OK, there's someone else to, calling out truth to power. And uh, yeah. I just appreciate you. I just appreciate you for who you are, you know, in, in speaking out at these times where we need a leader. We need role models right now to, to, to speak out. And and obviously you're one of them. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, you're going to get me emotional already. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to do that. I'm not trying to. <laughs> no, and it's just because it's just, it's so heavily on my mind that I just can't get it out of my head. And I'm just, yeah, I think like a lot of people, just angry and frustrated and there's nowhere to dump it. So that's, that was actually where, where my video came from. I just, I knew there were people who were feeling like me. There's just, who are angry and frustrated and just, I was sitting there feeling helpless and not being able to fight. I went through this before when my um, my ex-wife was struggling with cancer and I felt like I had no way to help her. I had no way to fight for her. So I made a video and it was very therapeutic for me because I felt like at least I was doing something and not just sitting silent. I was able to help her in some way so to just fight. And I, I did it to raise money for the type of cancer she was fighting. And that's kind of what I did with that video the other night. I just was sitting there with all this frustration and anger. And I just I just wanted to reach out to and connect with other people who are also dealing with this same thing and, and just let people know that just don't, you know, don't be silent. I think that's the worst thing. Like yeah. this is never a problem that will never be solved if we're all just sit back and and just be okay with it. Let's just all stand up and say we're not okay with this, you know. And, and uh, you know, just yeah. not be silent. Silence is, is the enemy. We all need to stand up. Everybody's. It's hard sometimes because you're going to take a beating when you have a strong stance on something. Somebody is going to disagree with you, and some people are going to aggressively disagree with you. And that is that's hard. Being in a fight is hard. It's not easy fighting, but it's something like this is a time when we got to stand up and we got to fight. And this is the civil rights movement of our time. And we got to unite in this and not be okay with it. Well, I, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Preach. And this is, you know, it, it is. I, I was just telling Joel, like I, I, I look at I look at anyone who trolls online is they're they're just as scared as I am. And they're just lashing out in in a very they're lashing out in an angry way because they're scared and because yeah. they're just not that everyone's scared, whether they are, are agreeing or disagreeing. Everyone's just scared and they don't know how to handle it. And it, it's the weirdest thing where when I've been tweeting out or making posts and, and you're getting, you're getting fair, I'm getting my fair share of just like trolling. It's like, I, I, I've never had this kind of empathy before. Like I, mm -hmm. I don't, I, 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 even if someone just doesn't get what I'm saying, like it's, it, I don't have this same anger that I, I would if, let's say, someone was trolling me with my movies or my body of work or something. It's just a. That's usually just, me, Ken. That's usually Joel. <laughs> Joel always gives me notes. He's like, Ken, you could do better. You could be taller. You could have better posture. I could work out. Like, a lot of it's just like, why aren't you like Dave Batista? I know. I he's, he's, yeah, he's like, you know, part. why don't you do. You just could just look like Dave or just be half a Dave or something. You know, I, I get a lot of uh, Drax notes from Joel, um, you know, but Joel and I go back way back from 2009. We're on community together. We've been war buddies since 09 where, um, you know, we were like he, he, he we, we were working on the show 110 episodes. We've been through the trenches. He's. He's my we triple. Paid, he's brother. my triple we H, Batista. Yeah, he's my paid. triple H. <laughs> <laughs> he's my I'll mentor. Be your triple H. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're my triple oh, so H, Joel. You, well, <laughs> you brought up wrestling. I also have to tell you that Titus O'Neil, uh, Thaddeus Buller, is a very close friend of mine. Um, he also says to say hello. Oh, uh, I love Titus is the best. Please and give him a laugh. Not a good-looking man. Not a <laughs> specimen. This is this man is the most so um, nice. is the most active person I've ever seen in and community and, and the community. He's, I've never seen somebody do yeah. so many good things for people. He's just such a, a stand-up guy. 
with he a would busy love to WWE with schedule, I, I follow him on social media. He goes to every him. children's hospital, every charity. Crazy. It's, it's insane crazy. on a full WWE schedule. Yeah, and local, know. same thing, man. When he gets home, the guy is never, he's never still. He doesn't sleep, man. He's just constantly, just, he just, he loves to do, he loves to help people. He's just a good, he's just a good person. And yeah, I'll, I'll just say this one. Doesn't sleep himself, you, Dave. You never sleep. You never I sleep. watched no. some videos of you. I'm like, we got, wait, she's somebody. talking about somebody who works harder than him? That seems yeah. impossible. I haven't been, I don't know about you guys, but I haven't, you know, I, I haven't been sleeping lately. It's, it's, you know, it's so weird. I, I was thinking about the way I felt uh, for the world trade, uh, when the world trade uh, uh, disaster happened. And I remember that anxiety, like it, I remember thinking that it, it didn't directly affect me, but it did directly affect me. And I couldn't figure out why. And but I, and I think most of America felt the same way. Like we were all traumatized from seeing this. From it happened. Even like I didn't lose somebody. I didn't lose a relative. I didn't lose a friend. And the World Trade bombing. But I um, still couldn't sleep. I still cried every day. I still hurt every day. And it's I feel like I have this that same kind of pain. And it's it's just because we're all traumatized. We're all traumatized. If you're a decent human being, you are traumatized by watching that video. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's a murder, it, it, and then to have that happen on top of a pandemic where we feel powerless to begin with, so we're already weakened. We're already weakened by our kryptonite just being at home. Like you know, right. all, all three of us, we we travel right. for a living, we entertain for a living, right? And and when we're staying at home and we can't do what we love to do, and have a right. passion to do that, so right. on top of that baseline. Then this happens. Right. It's tragic you're, on top of tragic. I, I we're, it's we're, yeah. We're we're weakened and we're separated and we're divided, and then we have a president who is encouraging that. That's crazy to me. That's insanity to me. That our president is encouraging our division. Like how does that? How does that happen? How does that? How does that happen in our country? I know how it happens. He has a personality disorder. I mean, he. Well, yeah, I'm talking medically yeah. speaking. Medically Absolutely. speaking, he's Absolutely. just when you're a malignant narcissist, and when you just yeah. um, when you when you can't take notes, when you can't take direction, yeah. when you can't take, when you can't pivot, when everything's yeah. about you, um, is textbook that's, medicine. There's no other way is, to say it. And um, that's. Absolutely, the truth. He and, is not a mentally healthy person. No, he and and, and honestly, he he will never know. He. He, he will never ever be able to feel the pain right. ever right. whether no. w whether he's in or out of office and that's the and that and that's the sadness of it all and and we're which all kind of held hostage me, to his neuroses right now right which leads me to my next thought is that he is not a mentally healthy person but are all the people who are still supporting him also not mentally healthy it it really is just a to me it's just a, he is the highest position of the land and everyone else has to, you know, his, his tradition abides that everyone else has to act accordingly. Either you're going to be for him or you're going to be against him. And so everyone right. are operating by certain rules where there's no yeah. rules where he's throwing away the playbook, you know. So it's there. there's this big dissonance that's going on in this country and it's, you know, fitting a square peg in a round hole. It's just you, you just – there's just nothing – Nothing's making sense, you know, because everyone's trying to uh, intellectualize, normalize, justify. It, it, there's all these things that are going on right now, and it's just, uh, it's just come to a head. It's just come to a yeah. head. And um, and and for me, I'm at a point right now. I'm not about. I I just I just want the problem to be solved. If Louis yeah. Trump right now could be, hey man, I was wrong about everything, you know, less. Um, let's put all four officers in jail. Let's like, let's, we got that vaccine tomorrow. I just want change. I just want change. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Don't, I don't care who does it. I don't care who does. I just want, I want effective change. And, yeah. and, and I think that's what affects me because like the pandemic affects me in such a way. Like when it came to the Mueller report, I didn't know anything about law. So I, I wasn't very confident, you know, in, 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 in my thoughts. And I would just defer to the experts. And when it, when it came, I don't know, when it comes to 
business of economics. I, I'm not I'm not an expert economist, and and I have an idea. My dad's an economist. I have an idea, but I, I really am not that confident about it. Okay, medicine. Okay, I know my medicine. I know what's up, and I know I could do a better job. Then we got a problem. You know, <laughs> you know that that that's where that's where that that's where that that's where my you know kind of my outspoken anger is coming from because I just know how to laser solve this, you know, or at right. least a, approach it like a laser. And that's where, that's why we did this podcast, Joel and I, because just like you, we all had projects, they all stopped. And yeah. Joel and I were talking about doing podcasts for a while. And then we, on normal podcasts, except today, you know, we talk about COVID-19 for yeah. a half hour. We bring a guest from community and, um, and then, you know, it's a nice little outlet, but, um, but right now it's evolved into this is kind of like uh, evolved into therapy for me. <laughs> yeah, totally. It totally is therapeutic. And I also have to say that I love I love that you have just, you know, everything that you've done and tweeted and been outspoken about is very it's very scientifically based. It's it's based as, as you know, coming from a medical standpoint, um, not because, you know, most of my stuff is emotionally based <laughs> a lot of stuff. And it's just. A lot of stuff. It's very rational. A lot of my opinions are very rational, and you know, I, I, I'll take five minutes to do my research before I, I say something. I, I don't want to, everything to be emotionally based, but um, you have a whole different credibility because you are a doctor and because people will listen to you. So, it, um, thank you is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> 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 well, Ken has always said, follow the science, follow the science, follow the science, and that's all you got to do. And the fact that, I mean, we had Daniel Kim on, and then he took hydrochloroquine. I can never say it. Hydroxychloroquine. Uh, yeah. Hydroxychloroquine. And that became, he was like, I did not realize it was a political thing before I took it. And, and then it became that thing, and he experienced tons of hate on either side when he came out he was like no this is my doctor prescribed for me and it it's just terrible that everything has become like not wearing like our president not wearing a mask it's a terrible example mm. uh to set and uh, it just uh or or as you were you were saying david like is everyone else crazy when uh obviously he he has the power and so they're protecting that and so when he says possibly injecting disinfectants and they say he was being sarcastic i mean i am sarcastic for a living but i go to the chuckle hut in cincinnati and yell at people in a converted um it's usually a it's usually like a, a mexican or a greek restaurant and that has been turned into a comedy club no but i'm uh, there is actually a converted Greek restaurant, I think in Cincinnati <laughs> that I played at, uh, and there's a Mexican one in, in, in Cleveland, but, uh, but the, I do that for a living as a joke. But if you're the president and then you say, obviously it's people compensating for what he said. And I, uh, it's, it's always like, guys, I get if you're conservative and you want that, but w you can't say anything about that. Uh, that, that was, it's just Bananas. And then today, when he did not address George Floyd's uh, murder, uh, he talked about the WHO. And it's just, uh, yeah, I mean, I rarely become political, but you, uh, everyone's forced to now. I never, I never was, um, which is something I said, Mike, because I, I didn't like, I, I didn't like be, being politically outspoken. I always felt like people should make up their own minds. They should educate themselves and make up their own minds. But I really felt like after, you know, things just started getting so bad, it was like I felt like it was my responsibility to start speaking up against what's going on because I just didn't – I felt like things had gotten that bad. And so I, I don't like being that, that guy. It makes me extremely uncomfortable. Me too. <laughs> but I also don't want – like I – and I use this term a lot, and I, but I believe in it. I Like I don't want to be on the wrong side of history, and I don't want to live with regret. Like, that's the most important thing to me. I don't want to live with regret. And if I don't say anything, I will regret it. Um, <laughs> that's exactly how I, I feel. I'm very uncomfortable with it. I mean, in, yeah. in, in many ways, this is, if any ways, this is finding fellowship with you too. Just kind of, I, I, it just, for, even from an entertainer standpoint, we're all speaking the same language. It's, mm -hmm. this is not our zone. I, I didn't, 
you know, I, I didn't I didn't go into entertainment to uh, start a podcast and speak out about politics. It's just like not in the cards for me. This was not like this is not like how I had planned it. And and um, and it's OK, Ken, you've got a guy's choice award behind you. So yeah, you can say what you I'm, want. Well, I guess got to just show Batista. I have a, a spike award just so I can look more manly. <laughs> I just he want has to a show similar him. trophy case, I, it's I'm sure. It's not even yeah. mine. I think it belongs to Triple H. But it's just something I just I need to show that I I just I just need a I just need a you know it's Batista man. I gotta I gotta you know I gotta I gotta you know act like I've been there. You know. <laughs> you have been there. <laughs> well, we were me and Joel last night, um, and Andrew, our producer, we we're we we were talking about how we we're like debating what we love about batista most it was like i love him on the I wwe want. i love him on james i love him in in, in james bond i love, I love him. his finger tattoos they're well, new. I love his finger tattoos like we literally got into a three-way argument of why our reasons of thinking dave is the best is the best <laughs> reason and it was just it it does amaze me that a that i know you and we're friends but even even that amazes we, me too. That amazes Joel. That, Joel, like <laughs> Joel, so nice of you, Dave. <laughs> th- th- this is the only time Joel's been nice to me on the podcast because he's like, "Oh, well, you know, Dave. I guess I got to be nice to you because it." So I've scored cool points, you know, with Joel. And no, uh, that's bad. It, but but it to me, your history, your journey, you like you when you're growing up in D.C. Did you mm. did you want to did you want to go? Hey, did you want to go in, into wrestling? Did you want to go into movies? Did you yeah. want to do what you were doing? You know, what was your? Oh, no, it was weird. And I grew up, you know, I grew up, uh, I'm born in D.C. And I grew up for the most part in Washington, D.C. But I lived a lot of years in San Francisco as well, like right in the city. My mom still lives there. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're, you're, I, you're Greek, I wanted you're, to. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say you're uh, Greek and you're yeah, Filipino. Yeah, I'm Greek. My dad's Filipino. That um, is not a usual. Uh, it's no, no. They were, you know, they were high school hearts and they got married and quickly got divorced. Well, not, they didn't quickly get divorced. They quickly separated. Um, they actually were married forever and they didn't get divorced until my father was going to get remarried. <laughs> so they were married for a long time, but they weren't actually together. Um, but I grew up in, you know, kind of the worst, not the worst circumstances, but not great circumstances. We were, we were poor. We were very poor. Um and we were in D.C. Um, through 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, D.C. was it was a very violent place, um, and so that's what I grew up with. That's what I witnessed as as a young kid, and and uh, which is you know is weird saying now, but like I, I love my childhood. I had a great childhood, and um, and when I you know like I said the other day in, in my video, I didn't grow up with racism, um, I, and I just didn't. I just don't remember it being a part of my life. It wasn't there. I was. When I was in elementary school in D.C., me and my sister were the only white kids in our in our elementary school. And I don't remember ever once having an issue because of the color of our skin. It was never a problem. And I grew up like that, and I don't remember dealing with racism. So it's still very foreign to me. I, I just don't I just don't get it. It doesn't compute. My mom's you guys also know my mom's a lesbian. And I don't remember like I don't remember ever getting teased or harassed or bother because my mom was a lesbian it was just it just was what it was especially in san francisco like every mom everybody's mom was a lesbian <laughs> it just wasn't. so the straight like haha your mom's straight yeah <laughs> we used to tease the hell out of those kids <laughs> oh no, your mom like dicks oh I wow deal i didn't deal with it it just wasn't a part of my life so it's you know, I was talking to a friend last week and I was like, and I said, you know, maybe there's a part of me that's in denial and because I just never right in front of my face. So I didn't see it. So I heard about it, but it was like this weird thing I just couldn't relate to, you know. But anyway, so back to my childhood and I was just I never wanted to be anything other than uh, not dead or not in prison until I was almost 30 years old. And it's just because I'd really never left my city. I was a bouncer from the time I was 17 till I was almost 30. And I bounced and I came home with cash in my pocket every night. And when I was almost 30, I was uh, humiliated that I had to go and borrow money from one of my um, employers uh, to buy my kids Christmas presents. It was it was awful. It was so humiliating. I remember crying about it and being so just feeling so worthless. 
And that was when I made a conscious decision. Like, I got to do something with myself. I got to get out of the, I got to get off my block. I got to stop bouncing. I got to stop being, you know, um, get out of my comfort zone, stop being comfortable here and do something bigger with my life to make my life mean something. Um, Cause up until then it just, I mean, I was content with coming home with, you know, pocket full of money every night and blowing it the next day, and going and lifting weights twice a day. And that's all I, I did. And uh, so anyway, I, I sat, I went out in pursuit of wrestling and I pursued the hell out of it until uh, I was world champion. And then I wanted to more for myself because I was limited within the WWE. And so I set out to pursue acting. And again, I, you know, I, I lost everything. I starved for a few years and then I got, I got guardians and it changed the course of my life. Jeez. I mean, well, there, Dave, going back to, I, I have to ask about like, how do you just go? I think I'm going to be a rest. I'm going to be in, I'm going to get into the WWE. Like you're like, you go from, I'm spending all my money each day. Yeah. Oh, I think I'll just be a professional wrestler. How yeah. does that, how did, how did, how do you get the start? So what happened was, um, I went for a tryout with a company called the WCW that was really hot at the time, and they were having open tryouts. And you just looked them up, like, or like it was in the newspaper no, or they something? Were or... Advertising this on television, like during the show, they were. It was a place called the Power Plant, and they, you know, you, they were advertising that you could come and try out to be a professional wrestler, and you go and you paid like three hundred bucks, and you could get a tryout. And so I did. I went and I, I borrowed money, went down, got a tryout, and they ran me into the ground, told me to leave, that I would never be a professional wrestler. I didn't have wow. what it took. What was the tri- what was the what was the uh, like what was the trial? It was basically um, it was basically boot camp. It was basically like an awful version of boot camp where they just ran you into the ground and yelled at you and screamed at you. And I was like doing all these exercises with guys that were like 150 pounds lighter than me. I was really big at the time. And they just singled me out and ran me into the ground till I was throwing up and puking on the ground and told me to leave and I'd never make it. I didn't have what it took to be a professional wrestler. And I was pretty crushed because I thought, you know, I thought I, I was pretty athletic. I look like a professional wrestler. I could be a professional wrestler. And then I thought, no, I can't be a professional wrestler. What am I going to do now? And then so I was upset for about a week and. And then I had a friend and he started, you know, help me start making calls to find out how else, like another avenue to pursue it. And so um, we found this camp in, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. It's a wild Samoan camp. And I borrowed money from him, um, a couple friends actually, to drop everything I was doing, move up to Allentown and start training uh, as a professional wrestler. And I did that for about a year before I got a trial with the WWE. And they signed me to a... Uh, a very low paying contract, but I was uh, being paid to train to be a professional wrestler. Did you ever call up the WCW and like wave the contract <laughs> in their face or anything? <laughs> no, no. I mean, what, you know, they were, they went out of business soon after that. They were, uh, that's know, because they, they were turning away talent. <laughs> They, they were like, wow. We did it again, guys. Hey, you know, know what? That, that, that's weird because I applied for the WCW and I got <laughs> in. I got in. I headlined. And, um, you know, and then in my first match, we went out of business before I even stepped on the ring. They was like, we're canceled. I'm like, canceled? Whoa. I, like, I paid $300 for this, guys. <laughs> and, you know, you never know what could have happened. And then, and then, you know, I saw cool. early footage. Um, WWE Network has a great... Um, documentary uh, about you. <laughs> I'm in it at the top, but uh, they have a great documentary about you <laughs> and um, you, of you trying out. Ken's you know, in you, this, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and still people decided to see it anyway. But the but they they have great footage of you in OVW, um, which yeah. is the W W tra- kind of like the farm league, and yeah. you were man you man not only looked jacked, but what was more impressive was the people you came up with in your class yeah. was John Cena, yeah. Randy Orton, Brock yeah. Lesnar. I mean, it was like all the superstars of today. They were in your college class. It's insane yeah. that class of, of of wrestlers that came out and that have all been huge superstars in the WWE. Yeah. That that's must have been I mean, it just must have been surreal, you know, looking back that you it started out with. It was it's in retrospect it's weird looking back. Um, seeing like all of us there together, but I have to be honest with you, and I say this not with arrogance, but at the time we all we all knew we were we knew that we were the next generation. We all felt it. We were, were encouraged to feel it. Uh, it was something that was instilled in us, and we were 
brought together for a reason. So I think we were all really bonded together and we knew we were going to kind of move up together and be the generation of, of WWE superstars. I say that with pride. I'm very proud of that class. I'm very part, proud to be a part of that class. What I loved is that you you formed Evolution with Triple H and my favorite wrestler of all time, Ric Flair, and mm. Randy Orton. And right. that, to me, I, I actually I still don't know how did you how did you get the call and the nod to be a part of Evolution. It was uh, well, I I. I didn't get a call, but it was weird because we started, there's a lot of rumors in WWE. You always hear rumors, <laughs> a lot of rumors. You know? And Randy and I started hearing rumors about it. So we started talking to each other about it. Like, oh my God, God, I hope this happened. We're just kind of praying. And then finally it was Triple H one day that just pulled us aside and said, hey, this is what we're going to do. And we, you know, and that was it. I mean, the rest is kind of history. Um, but I, I, I really feel like we were one of the best factions to ever come out of the WWE. I'm very, very proud of that time, what we accomplished. I was telling Joel and Andrew last night, my favorite, actually my favorite Batista moment in, in the WWE is not you winning the championship and being a champion on SmackDown for a year. My favorite moment is the thumbs down. That yeah. thumbs down to Triple yeah. H, dude, just to yeah. see the, as an entertainer, just to see yeah. you literally had the audience right. on your thumb. It was, <laughs> you it, was, it, was such, it was such a good build, and I always give credit to Triple H for that because he was very... Uh, very insistent about the way he wanted that to happen. And he fought with Vince, like verbally fought with him and argued with him to make really? sure this was a slow build. Yes. He, Vince wanted um, to do it fast? He wanted to do it? Oh, my God. As soon as Vince, you know, heard people rumbling, he was like, we got to do this. We got to do it now. We got to get it. And, you know, he wants to put the match on TV like next week. And it was like, no, we no. We to do it fast. No, no, Hunter wanted to, you know, build it slow. And so when it finally erupted, like it erupted. And he wanted to also build me as a future champion. So he went, he, he did it very methodically and he was very, very adamant about the way he was going to build this program. And, and I learned a lot from him, watching him do this and watching him fight for this because it was the right thing. It was the right. Thing. And you could tell by the people's reaction, but he actually had to fight for it, which uh, prepared me in later years to fight with Vince. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Jeez. Well, I'm, I'm sure it's just, uh, it, it, it it's probably no different than being on a show like SNL where, you know, you have the boss. You have, I mean, that's Vince's yeah. company, yeah. and he he's the final arbiter. He's a final decision maker right. no matter. I keep hearing that all the time, um, right. you know, having uh, having other friends in the WWE. It's just yeah. at the end of the day, Vince is the head writer or head producer. Right. I don't want to call it writer, but just a head producer at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. He is he has a final word. It's his company. It's, he always has a final word. So that's, you know, you pick your battles. You know, you, yeah. You know, sometimes you you give them you give them one. You just you know, <laughs> and just prepare for the bigger battles. The most important thing. But I always believed in you know nothing's more impro- important than my program. I realize that we got a whole other show going on here, a whole other show, a whole a bunch of other stories. But my program was what I was protective of. My storyline is what I was protective of. So always pick my spots and. You know, but it is, it's a very, it's a, it's a political business. You know, I think a lot, a lot of people don't realize, but it's very political business. How did you like, so obviously, yeah, but I, I, this is what I'm always so impressed by is that when they hand you a microphone, they're like, Mm -hmm. all right, uh, you got three minutes to, uh, this is what you're, this is the plan. Uh, I don't know. Cause you even said it in the short documentary. uh, Well, that little, the YouTube video where you're (laughs) shooting in Toronto and then you're just kind of putting together what you're going to say. And I'm like, oh, there's going to be this is I mean, I do. Stand, I mean, Ken and I have done stand up in front of hundreds of people <laughs> and you walk out into these packed arenas. And I, I was just like, here's a mic. And I don't think people understand how intimidating and uh, the fact that you just didn't, I mean, I know I would just start stuttering probably going like, and then I'm going to be, yeah. I'm going to totally <laughs> pin you. Okay. But, bye. And then I, I that, well, that was me. That was me at, at first. And still I struggled with it until up until the last time I ever spoke to an audience because I was always uh, had a horrible phobia of public speaking. I still struggle with it. I have really, really bad social anxiety. Um, but what I, you know, I learned little tricks along the way. And one of the most important things I learned was that I am not good with a script. If you give me bullet points, I will go out there and make those points. If you give me a script to remember, I'm just going to 
forget and stutter and panic, and it's just going to be awful. But it took a lot of it took a lot of uh, bad promos to figure that out and to learn that, and also to be in the position to say, "I'm not doing your damn script. Give me some bullet points. I'll go out and make them." You can always have you don't always have the power to do that, but if you start drawing a lot of money for the company. You do. <laughs> so I, that's that's why I change. Also, sounds really weird, but I learned that um, I I deal with social anxiety better when I wear glasses, when I wear tinty glasses, when I wear hats, when I have some type of pacifier to hide behind. Oh. And so that's why I do like a lot of times, especially if I'm in public, if I'm at a red carpet or something like that, I will wear a tinted glasses or sunglasses. It just it helps my anxiety. Um, so the same with wrestling. If I wore hats and glasses and something to hide behind and, and just kind of spoke my own words and just made it very conversational, then I didn't struggle as much. I still did a little bit, but not as much because public speaking for me is a, is a nightmare. Ken hides that, behind his jowls all the time, which you know I think is a really good. If I, I would actually, for me to get in the ring again, I would have to actually wear, wear, put a pacifier in my mouth, like, yo, <laughs> big baby's coming at you. <laughs> that's what I would do, just to deal with my anxiety, and also, and also, I'd wear a diaper, but that's for other reasons. But right. he's wearing would, one now. How did it feel? Um, how did it feel coming back last year when you when you did your retirement match? It felt it felt amazing, and because I think it was my return before that was it was awful. It was I did nothing but argue and argue, and I went back in good faith. And this time I came back uh, under certain conditions, and it, those conditions were going to be that I I was going to be able to do what I wanted to do, and it was going to be I was going to have my final match with Triple H, the guy I wanted to have it with, and we were going to go along a certain a guideline of where we wanted this match to go. Uh, and I also was very insistent that I wanted to go out on my back. I want to leave wrestling on my back. I want to lose because the guy who's going to be there after I lose and leave is still going to have, he's going to have credibility of beating me. He, you know, he's not, I'm not retiring right off the sunset with a win. Uh, I, that's the tradition of our business. That's the way it should always be. Um, so nice. it, was, it was great. I, I loved it. It was, it, and I always tell the people this and it, you know, some people don't quite get this, but, that means my last match means more to me than being in the Hall of Fame by far. The Hall of Fame is nothing. I, I don't need accolades. I don't need people to say you did a great job, Dave. I feel I feel a sense of closure, a sense of satisfaction from my final match because I came back. I put it on the line. I didn't play it safe. It was a hard match. I was beat up. I'm still beat up. I so I still suffer from an issue that I got uh, have that an, an injury that I got in that match. But I feel com I feel okay with it because I I wanted to leave the fans with that so they knew how much I cared that I wasn't a guy who just I didn't leave the WWE because I hated it because I was re resent for it full of it I I love being there but I just I had to leave or I would have been I would have been limited for the rest of my life and I had to leave it it, it was it was such a intense violent match where I was. I was gutted because I was actually doing a show and I, you know, I, and, and you were yeah. so gracious to invite me to be your guest. Oh. And I, I was so, I, I was so gutted at that I had to do my show. And, and right after I finished my own show on the road, I went to my hotel room, watched it on the network and was the, I mean, literally like Triple H like ripped your nose <laughs> ring out at the top of the match. Yes. And then he's about you know, you're about to deliver the Batista bomb like on a table and you flip over onto another table. And I'm like, I worried as a doctor, I'm like, you're back, you're back. And then you did and then you did more Then, then he flipped you on your back on like the, the, the metal stairs multiple yeah. times. I mean, yeah. you, you were doing it was not like. It was not like, you know, spinning toe hold, <laughs> headlock fest. It was like, this was so, and you're shooting three movies at the same time. This is not like you just doing wrestling and then you get to recover for three months and maybe do a movie at the end of the year. I just finished a movie with you, man. It was like yeah. insane. Well, that was the thing. And that's, that was the reason. Cause I, I knew that the fans would appreciate that. That, that that's what I was giving, that I was putting it on the line. I was putting my health on the line, my body, my career on the line for them. I knew that they would appreciate it, and I wanted that to be my legacy. Um, but just so funny, but the, I have two funny stories about that match. Please. For one, you, pick, you picked up on the bump that really hurt. The one on the table, 
although probably doesn't look like the most painful, hurt me the worst. It was hard continuing the rest of the match. My back was killing me. Mm-hmm. Um, and also the nose ring thing. Hunter, <laughs> I would <laughs> never wear a nose ring into the ring. <laughs> and I took it out, and Hunter said, uh, you're going to wear your nose ring, right? And I was like, no. He goes, but I want to yank it out. I was like, yes. <laughs> I was like, what a weird that. question. You're going to wear your nose ring yeah. in the ring, right? <laughs> Not where you want to do oh, it. Don't, I don't. was like, God, I love that. I just, I love it. It was so, just so great. It so really, I wore that in just so he could I, rip it out. <laughs> and, wait, and then you got back in that jet. You flew back to Toronto, <laughs> and they were like, yeah, good news, you get three hours of sleep, <laughs> and then you're in hair and makeup. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, you've broken your back. Your back is crashed <laughs> in half. Yeah, it's it still bothers me a little. I there was some there was a horrible bump. It hurt. It hurt. <laughs> it hurt really bad. And I don't say that a lot, but it, it hurt. I will. I will say this. Ken cannot relate. No, <laughs> I can't relate. I mean, you. you did, I mean, you and I. If, if if community ever comes back, you and I should just do a no DQ match, Joel. <laughs> I could be. Yes, we should. <laughs> That's we'll Hey, I will. I'll pitch to the writer. Could uh, Senior Chang and Jeff Winger just do a no holds barred match? Just I don't know. <laughs> For community should, mania, please. That'd be amazing. We'll just, we should do a live show. We'll do a live show. But then, uh, then, you know, in between Guardians of the Galaxies happen, Avengers, Infinity War happens, which you, like, stole yeah. that movie. Just, I never asked you, how did you get the part of Drax? I, uh, so... <laughs> Went to a tryout. The WCW guy was there again. Yeah, you He's tried like, out, you uh, called the power plant? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I literally, I had been uh, struggling. I worked like a few times in three years after I left wrestling, and I had gone broke. Um, wow. I had not only gone broke, but my, you know, that was my, I don't remember when we had our really bad uh, real estate crash. Yeah. And my house was upside down, and I bought high, and I couldn't get rid of this house. And not only that, but the IRS came after me. Uh, after I left wrestling, I had not paid some taxes that I wasn't even aware of. We actually went to them with the issue, and I ended up getting screwed on it. So they, not only could I not sell my house because the IRS put a lien on it, but it was upside down. So I had to do a voluntary foreclosure <laughs> on my house. Oh. But my and boxes, and I was getting ready to move to L.A. because I was so desperate to uh, audition. I couldn't even get an audition, so I was going to move to L.A. And I had uh, my agent at the time just became my agent and he became my agent agent. He turned me down three times, but I kept running into him because he represented a friend of mine named Kung Lee. So I'd run into him all the time and he just called us up kind of out of nowhere. He said, I really like Dave. His name's Brett Orangeburg. He called me. He said, I really, I really want to help Dave. He's just a good dude. I want to help him. And like a week later he called and he said, Hey man, I don't, I don't want you to get your hopes up. <laughs> But I got you this audition, and I really had to fight to get you audition because they didn't want any professional wrestlers. But uh, would you fly out here and take the auditions for a Marvel film? And I said, sure, I'd love to. And I so I I I got with my acting coach to go over this, you know, these sides because I just couldn't make heads or tails out of them. It made no sense to me. And I flew out to L.A. and I did the audition. Um, I did it with Sarah Finn, and she was couldn't have been any more like gracious and friendly, and just made me feel comfortable. So I did the audition. And I was set to fly back to Tampa the next day. And the, she called me later the day, later that day and she said, would you mind coming back tomorrow and reading for the director? I said, no, not at all. So I stayed in town. Uh, I didn't sleep. I went back and I met James, um, fell instantly in love with James and auditioned. And then so I went home um, and there was kind of months of waiting. They didn't wouldn't exclude me from the part, but they... They didn't give me the part, so I think they were auditioning people, and I just waited and waited and waited, and then came back for a couple more tests and screen tests and chemistry tests. And I, I got the call one day. My manager called me, said, "Hold on, I, I got Brett on the phone." And they called me. I thought they were going to break my heart and tell me I didn't get the part. And they said, "You got the part. Pack your shit. You're going to London." I broke down. I broke down in tears. And they turned around. Uh, went home. I was just in tears and just started packing my stuff. And I moved to London for seven months and came back home uh, to Tampa after filming. And my stuff was still in boxes. And literally the, the first call I did, because now I felt like I can go back to wrestling because now I've accomplished what I set out to accomplish. I'm not going back with my tail between my legs. So I called him up and said, hey, I really want to come back and do some wrestling. 
And so that was my 2014 run when I went back and, and wrestled for a few months. Wow. They yeah. were auditioning a lot of people because yeah. I auditioned for that role. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, wow. are you serious? I'm dead serious. Yeah. Oh, my oh, God. God. You yeah, auditioned I, for Drax? I totally auditioned for Drax. Oh, I, I thought you were for the raccoon. I thought you were the raccoon. Um, what the, the how what, what the i just heck, thought just the, you look like a raccoon I, and you would be how, how do i look like a raccoon I thought you were a rocket. you're a rocket i'm six four oh, okay okay you know just hey i have an opinion i just i just shared it that's all but no wow uh, it really was the two... i didn't get past that i didn't get past the casting director <laughs> I, I i think what's amazing about drax is how it's evolved even from the com i mean it very very soon on it just as a comedian you just you're dear god mastery of yeah. deadpan as drax <laughs> i mean there is just nothing funnier than you throwing away a line this is coming from an over actor and joel will will tell you many tales of me overacting no. no ken come on <laughs> and, every time you walk into a scene it's just it's like roger moore <laughs> Amazing. It's like James Bunting. You know, I love, and I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm going to get off this subject real quick, but you know what I love about Kenny when he's acting is he has conversations with himself. Like he's Joel, acting, he's doing his lines. That's a, that's not right. <laughs> and he Joel yells at himself. You, Joe will tell you. He <laughs> breaks oh himself gosh. and then continues on. <laughs> Dave, when he breaks, there's this one scene, and we've talked about it, but when he, he could not stop breaking. And so what he does to try to make himself not laugh is just quietly whisper dead babies, dead babies, dead babies to himself, <laughs> which is possibly the most disturbing because in Ken's brain, he's like, I know how to make myself not laugh. Picture um, dead babies. Geez. And then it doesn't work. Yeah. That's the best part. There was a moment in my spy where um, where we had a one on one scene and you just started improvising and uh, I was his his boss, a CIA agent and uh, head of the CIA. And I'm like, can you read minds? And, and Dave's like, yeah. I was like, what are you thinking right now? And then that was just blue sky for Dave. You're like, dude, I still remember you. Go, okay. JJ, you're like amazing. And I'm just, I'm so honored to be with you. And he just went off and did this improv for like two minutes and I could not like, stop um, laughing. And the director, Pete Siegel, who I've worked with before, he's a buddy. And he said, come on, come on, man. Just, just come on, dude. Look, this is Dave. Dave is like the head producer. Dave hired me for his movie. He's like, come on, dude. This is your boss. You're actually working with your boss, Ken. So just, can you just do it for, for Dave once? And I was worried, just like on Community, that I wouldn't get through that scene with you because you you you, you had this extended rant for three two or three yeah. minutes that was like Dave, there was another time in Community where Ken could not stop laughing, and the director just goes, "Okay, you're out of the scene." He Leave literally, the scene. yeah. I could, yeah. There's a scene with David <laughs> he just Cross. No longer in the scene with Dave, with David like, Cross. Yeah, it was like when I'm working with with people like you, people who are my heroes. I, I there's this kind of I, I get I kind of mark out. I become a fanboy again. I'm here. I'm doing a scene with David Cross, and he's one of my favorite comedians of all time. And he was so funny again, just riffing a song, ad libbing the song, and. I w we were on a bed, sitting on a bed, and I was, I, I wasn't laughing. I was biting my finger, but the bed was shaking while Dave, while the camera was he's, on David Cross, and, he, and David Cross like, he goes, "Come himself. on, Ken." And then <laughs> the director politely asked uh, Rob Schraub, he goes, "Ken, would you mind leaving for this?" I was like, "Yep, I'll leave." I was just like, "I felt so bad." I was like, "Gladly, I don't want to hold up shooting. They don't need me for this, so um, I don't want to ruin. I don't want to ruin more stuff." But. Uh, but I put Dave, you I had, in that category of actor, Dave, where you, man, you it, just make people break. It's yeah. crazy. <laughs> well, Ken, bef right before this, I texted Joe Russo, and I was like, I heard that Dave did a lot. Like, I've heard it, that he improvised a lot. And then Russo was like, he improvised all that shit. And, <laughs> and I was just like, like damn. And the yeah, whole yeah. part where the whole one where you're like, if I just don't move, then you can't see me. And um, I just when it really makes me mad uh, because oh, yeah, you're so talented. Thing. Oh, my God. And <laughs> that, see, Joe Russo was one of the founding fathers of community. He helped. He oh, was really? one of the in-house directors and EP. Oh, so he helped. He and Anthony community. directed like almost 45 episodes yeah, of it. They directed no like idea. all the early episodes, all the best ones. And I love 
Yeah, and we go way back with Joe. With Joe, and um, we had him on the podcast a few weeks ago, and we were just talking how my favorite scene in both comedically in both in either Avengers movies that they did was the why is Gamora scene that I've watched it so many times. It it yeah. literally <laughs> it like and when I'm in a bad mood like tonight, I'm sure when I'll be in a bad mood tonight, I will just cue up that scene and and just watch it because it's like it's just comedy heaven you have Pratt, Downey and you it's like wow they're just sharing the ball it's like it's like Rodman, Jordan and Pippen they're just like sharing the ball and, and then you you give the dunk you know Elvis <laughs> Holland, Holland on that scene just couldn't he couldn't not break he was I'm pretty sure that he pissed himself he just he could not hold it in he just kept dying laughing it was so funny oh man you yawning during Iron Man's speech like just <laughs> yawning, <laughs> just like, and he goes, and then Tony Stark goes, "Are you yawning? When, what, when, when are you yawning?" He goes, "When did you start yawning?" And he goes, and he just said, "You just throw every line away." Just started <laughs> yawning when you when you had a plan. I mean, the way you said it, I can't even. This is what I do for a living. I mean, this is all I've yeah. done, and then this is what we do. This is what we do. You, comedy, and then you do it better than us. It, it's <laughs> it's it's it, it really is ridiculous. Your your range and your talent, and and we'd be remiss to say because Andrew um, and my wife, their favorite movie that year was Blade Runner twenty forty nine, and your oh, yeah. opening scene, man, yep. brother, that just shows another element. Not only are you the funniest guy in the world, you're also the most dramatic guy in the world. Your range, it, it was two different people. I mean, you just go. Is your approach now as an actor? Do you? You kind of have a methodology, and and did, did wrestling help? Like, were you kind of going? If you're the animal, no, you go into the I, animal. You go into so and so. I can honestly say that wrestling um, did not help. It just. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I did not, I did not expect that. <laughs> no, they're so, they're so different. You know, it's apples and oranges. Like, it's all fruit. It's all entertainment. But it's so they're so different, and acting is so precise and so intimate. Um, and so, you know, you, I get so self-conscious about it, but no, it's just, I mean, they're different, but I think that's why I became so obsessed with acting because it's, I mean, it's just such a, it's such an amazing craft. It's something you have to learn, but I'm, I'm absolutely obsessed. I, I love acting. I love it. And I love, I, I want to be that guy who has range. You know, I wanted people to look past my, check, my check, check mark. Physical appearance check mark. and see me as a real actor. I, I, you know, I want to be respected as an actor. I'd rather have, I'd rather have credibility and respect than a big fat paycheck. It means more to me. Um, so that's it. That I, I choose that diverse good. roles, and I want people to see me as something other than a, a set of pecs. <laughs> you know, but I, I got to work with Denny again in Dune. I'm very excited about oh, this that's film. Right. Uh, yeah, I very wait. excited about this film because he's. But he really looked, I mean, he's a, like a true fan of the novel and he is going to do this, this, the novel's justice. Um, everything I've seen so far, it's just amazing. Like he has just, he has such an eye and he is probably the most precise performance director I've ever worked with. And when he has a vision, um, he just, I mean, he just knows how to um, communicate that vision to you to get the best performances out of actors. And I just, I mean, I love that. I love I'm an actor that loves to be directed. And so working with him was, uh, was quite an honor. And even more so in Dune because he called me up and offered me the part. Not Because the first, for Blade Runner, he didn't want me for the part. Originally, he didn't want me to, for, for the part. So you and fought I for that? Really, you fought for that? I, oh, I really fought for it. And not against him because he just, I went out, I left Guardians 2 to go out and talk with him about the part. And as soon as I got there, he said, you know, I, I hate to tell you this, but you're you're too young for the part. You're just you're wrong for the part. And I was I was crushed. <laughs> and so but we sat down and we talked um, for like an hour just about films. We talked about films and I went back to Atlanta thinking, uh, yeah, they don't have the part, but I got at least I got to sit and talk with Denny. Um, and then the producers really wanted me for the part. So they had me do some makeup tests and send it to Denny. He was like, he still doesn't like it. And um, so wow. then he had, they paid a bunch of money to actually have me do a makeup full, full costume and a screen test. And so I did my screen test and I performed as uh, Sapper and Denny uh, loved it. And he said, 
I was wrong. You're the fuck, you're the, you're the guy. <laughs> and he gave me the part. And then funny thing is when I showed up uh, on set to perform the role of Sapper, I did it as I auditioned. And he was like, no, 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 no. That's all wrong. <laughs> wow. So he completely changed it on me. And so which I, I, I was confused at the time because I got the role playing him Sapper a certain way. But he wanted him a different way. He's I thought Sapper was a very ominous character, a very dark, mean character. And Denise said he's not an ominous character. He's a sad character. All he wants to do is live. That's all this guy wants to do is live. And so I started looking at Sapper in a different, you know, a different direction or a different way, a different perspective. And so that's he came out the way you see him. Was that screen. on set when he told you that? Or was on that set. Yeah, because I started performing him a certain way, and then he stepped in and said, "This, this is wrong." Wow, man, you have the heart. You just There's... have the heart of an actor, man. You're just you're you're like a surgeon. You just go in there with, with precision. I, I, I get what you're saying, man. You you really yeah. all you care about you, is performance. Yeah, and then you can pivot like that and take that direct. I mean, that's I love yeah. it. I love it. Yeah. I'm 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 an athlete. I'm, you know, it's, mm. it's like being coached. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's I, I use that term a lot, but I'm coachable. I'm a coachable person. And it's, it comes from an a, a, athletic mentality. You know, I like to be coached. Something to think about, Ken. So yeah, I, another... yeah, that's the thing. I don't like to be coached. It takes a long time for me to learn anything new. When directors <laughs> give me notes, I cry. Um, so I guess we're no. opposites in that respect, Dave. I... I feel like those are just suggestions from the directors, <laughs> and um, and what I like to do is go with my gut and just double down, you know, when it counts. And a lot of times I'm wrong, you know. Um, you know, uh, talk to Pete Siegel, uh, our mutual director on My Spy. He'll tell you he's got a lot of stories of uh, here goes Ken doubling down. And no, um, Ken, and I, 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 hate, out. I hate it when Ken insults himself. It pisses <laughs> me off because he's fucking Rumpelstiltskin, as you know, <laughs> oh, and uh, he can yeah. spin thing like laughs where there weren't laughs there before, and it is maddening. I, I so, have so many heroes. I follow heroes, and I follow people who I love, and it will kill me to compliment you, Joel, on this podcast. Oh, but shit. I really Don't. love what you've done on Community. I really do, and you'll never hear that from me again. And then, but I just love. I know. I hate. Com we're that close. We don't like complimenting each other. But Dave has to I, sit here and watch this. I really <laughs> like, I just love working with people I'm a genuine fan of and, and I respect and I can learn something from. And, and that to me excites me in any aspect. If I feel like I can learn from somebody, I'm in, you know, and, yeah. and that. And what yeah. I loved about My Spy is that this was a movie that you produced, that you came up yeah. with. This yeah. was your production and like me, Kristen Shaw, just a great cast of people. Just we, it, it was just great to have you like as the boss. You know, it was it, that was the reason why I did the movie was because of you. I wanted to just meet you, work with you, and uh, yeah. you know, and here we are. But it was I, you're a great boss to work for. <laughs> I, I love hearing you say that, and I because I feel the exact same way. I feel like. Like, I'm a student, and I like putting myself next to people that I, I will learn from. Like, that's been very important to me throughout my career, whether it be wrestling or acting. It's more about who you associate yourself with, who you're learning from. I like being a, a student. I like picking people's brains. I like feeling like I'm learning something new. It keeps me alive. It makes me feel young. Um, so th this is why I became obsessed with acting. I felt like I was on cruise control with wrestling, I, and I... I felt like I needed to leave at that point to uh, just keep, you know, I don't know, making things happen for me in my life to keep, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, uh, the, the Dave, there's a movie I have to bring up because I love it so much, and that's Bushwick. And mm. uh, I, uh, I was so I was asked to watch it. They were like, "There's this movie of Bushwick uh, starring Dave Bautista and Brittany Snow. You should watch it because." There was another movie that John and uh, Carrie were doing, but then I watched Bushwick and I was like, oh, I, I just yeah. couldn't believe how good it was mm -hmm. and how I was like, oh, right. Yeah. He can be the lead in a movie because that was the first time I saw you yeah. as the lead. And this movie is bonkers from beginning <laughs> to ending. Yeah. And you guys, his ending speech, yeah. that ending Thank is you, extraordinary. Thank you. I, you know, it's weird as so. Uh, so that was one of the films that we did that that film for for no money. It's uh, 
it was a, a three million dollar production. Um, we did we shot a lot of stuff without permits. <laughs> <laughs> just so you, they shot it on the streets of Bushwick, and, the street, and they around. couldn't close the streets. <laughs> There's people you can see people strolling, and then other people running away from what are like snipers on the roofs and. And that was one of those things where we went in with kind of half a script. I originally that was one of those roles I, I took because I was desperate for people to see me, you know, outside of my box, see me as a, someone with vul vulnerability, someone with flaws, um, someone people could identify with. That was me trying to grow as an actor. Also, because of the long takes, I knew it wouldn't give me the luxury of, of, of edits that I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to be a better actor. And so those are like some of the reasons. But originally, when I read the script, uh, I, I didn't like it because um, the character I played, Stu, was he was a horrible. He was a horrible person. He wasn't a very, he wasn't a very likable guy at all. And I wanted people to be able to empathize with this guy. So we changed him around, changed his whole backstory. And the directors were generous enough to uh, that whole monologue at the end was something they they let me create and i told them i i think i have the story the backstory for stoop um would you trust me to just do it so i went on um set with them not knowing what i was going to say and then i did it and they and their mouths dropped open oh my god <laughs> yeah you guys got it's it's it is unexpected this movie is it's uh, have you ever saw the movie run lola run the german film with uh i love the movie Franca Patente, I think, and uh, it's got that same pace uh, mm. to it, and it's but this is all oneers, yeah, and and then at the you'll see at the ending, uh, and there was there was a moment in the movie though that I was pulled out. I went I because I was like I don't know how he just did that, and that was when you uh, you kill the guy that bursts into the kitchen, and you body slam him. Yeah. And it's there's no cuts. And I because now I know Carrie and John because I just did a movie with yeah. them. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's called Becky coming out June 5th. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Sure. That's uh, coming out next also, week. Yeah, sorry. I love those. Uh, We've been looking they're, for another project. I love oh, them. But how? But I was like because I said to Carrie and John, I was like, so when Dave body slammed him, that man died. Right. Because there's no way <laughs> I've met. You won't yeah. believe it when you see it. And I. Yeah. I have to ask you, how did you do it without killing that man? Um, just um, making sure he landed flat. I mean, it was one of those things where when we had the discussion, because we knew that we had the one take and we had to get it right. I said, so we're going to do this. It's going to be violent. And but if we do it and it's violent, we only have to do it once. If it's not good enough, something breaks. We're going to have to go back and do it again and again and again. So uh, he was up for it, and I knew how to protect him. It was something I take pride in professional wrestling. I, I've never injured anyone. Uh, so he trusted me to, to, you know, protect him and keep him safe. And, and he landed flat, and it was not, it, you know, it was painful, but it didn't cause yeah. injury. And it his just, head didn't, the back of his head, I can't believe I'm getting any specifics, no. but the back of his head didn't hit the ground. No. no. It's in, I had to stop wow. the movie, and I just rewound the scene like eight times, and I was like, how did this man... Yeah not die when yeah. dave slammed it was one of the best stunts i've ever seen it's, yeah thank you yeah thank you i i, I take pride in that because it was it was it was it was violent but it was meant to be violent it was meant to uh to get that reaction and it was it was real you know and he but he tried and you know, i took care of him and uh we just made it the best we could and then Go ahead, Ken. No, it just, to me, you are what you say you are and, you know, what you use as your hashtag. You're a dream chaser. You just, whatever you are, it's, there's something about, like, watching that Last Dance documentary, documentary about Michael Jordan was like, he was just always in the moment. And, you know, I, I, it's a, just every time I talk to you, it's a reminder for me just to, you know, just to be present because yeah. uh, we are in a business and in a society where we always have to, Think of our next move, our third move, our fourth move, our backup move. Our, you know, there's a lot of fear-based decision making, and it's just a reminder, uh, just to you just have to be present, and you just never know. You just never, and and you just are always in just right here, as opposed to sometimes I fail where I just think too much or I get too too caught in the weeds of my own. I don't know, my own anxieties. It's a very, it, you just don't know what you can accomplish if you're just in the moment. Yeah. yeah. 
But I think we're all guilty of that sometimes. You know, so I think, you know, you, the best thing you can do is be aware that you get caught up in that sometimes. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. where if you're aware, then you realize you're getting caught up on it. Even if you recognize it a little late, you still recognize it and you can change direction. You can put yourself back on track. Yeah. Yeah, you're the best therapist I've ever had, Dave. I really appreciate that. It's uh, it's been great. I mean, I remember just, when I remember yeah. when because speaking of self examination, they asked John Cleese about Kevin Klein in A Fish Called Wanda, and they were like, "Well, what do you think of his process?" And he goes, "He makes Hamlet look decisive," and and I was like, <laughs> "Oh, that's such a great way to describe." <laughs> the process like this because because like you think about like how brilliant kevin klein is and then you're like oh he second guesses himself all the time oh, really? but then no idea you know in the moment he gets that then they, like he lasers it and he obviously freaking nails it every he's such a genius what but, a great uh, quote he's <laughs> but it was like he makes hamlet look decisive i'm totally stealing that oh, yeah too. well this was in the set, and it's on another interview when he was asked why british food is so bad and john cleese just goes we had an empire to run and I was like, that can't top that. That's a pretty good one. I think oh. every second guesses themselves or gets self conscious about things. I would, I would, I would question an actor who didn't do that. And I, and I found out, uh, you know, uh, the more the more I, I, I come into my journey, uh, the more interaction I have with other actors, I found that I find that more to be common. That most act, a lot of actors are self conscious and are second guessing themselves it's just not a lot of them or not everybody's open about it but i love people who are open about it because i like having I, it makes me more comfortable who are your heroes in acting i mean did you either in comedy or drama or both who do you identify um, with you mean as far as um like people i like who's acting i admire yeah like i mean was there any like when you're doing i guess what i was just thinking with drax you know there's 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 like uh there's so much deadpan in your comedy where you're doing mm. so little and it's, you know, it's like Peter Sellers or, you know, did you, yeah. know, were you, were you, were you having, so you know, were you thinking of other, did you have other, you know, envision other actors and like, let's say for Drax? Yeah, no, <laughs> wow. no, I think, no, I think I was mostly just trying to follow direction. I don't think I ever had anybody in particular in mind who I was trying to kind of emulate or I think I, there's actors certainly that I, I admire, but, uh, yeah, I don't know any yeah. that I was particularly trying to emulate, but I like to. I well, I like to go. I was given some acting advice early on for, in my career from a, uh, an actor named a great actor named Tomorrow Morrison, and he yes. said that I, you know, Tim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a he's, he's good amazing. Good but he said this to me, and it was really. And I've used this throughout my career. He said, "Before you go to bed every night," he said. Uh, read your lines, learn your lines, uh, because you want to show up and you want to know your lines, be professional, but read them like this. Blah, 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 blah. He said, don't put any thought into them. Just, you know, just know your lines. Have a gist of what your lines are. And I said, what, why do you do that? He said, because if you start reading your lines and you start rehearsing in your head, you're going to go to set with your mind already made up on how you're going to perform that scene. That's Damn good advice. And when you do that, yeah, you're gonna just just gonna be fighting against everything because one actor may be have another idea in his head, the director may have another vision in his head, and you're gonna have three different people doing the same scene. He said, you you want to have be malleable with everybody. You want to you know be there and bounce off of people. Be you know flexible. Be you know be let yourself be directed. And I think that was like some of the best advice that I've ever gotten. Like yeah. don't go with a certain you know performance in mind. Just go and bounce off the people who are there, and like you said, be in the moment. Community, Live in the moment. yeah. Community reflected that for me because when I got the job on Community, I was just a year out of practice and of medicine, so it was my first time I'd been a series regular, and so I'd work with my acting coaches, and I was so nervous being on the show, and that I would over prepare. I would over prepare. I remember you. will will forget this, Joel, but there was a scene where our our characters were doing just uh we were doing a storyline together and i had rehearsed it me looking to your to my left i had i had rehearsed it over rehearsed it this is Mm. early on in in my career one of the early episodes of community and i remember yeah i forgot this and and most of the scenes we were in i forgot yeah that's true (laughs) for good good reason because i'm a dick there there was there was I had overprepared. I remember telling the director, no, I, I really need Joel to my left because I had always envisioned in my left I'd overprepared out of anxiety. 
and mm. I can't watch. And they sometimes they show that scene in some some clips, and fans make clips. I can't watch it because I cringe because I did not. I telegraphed everything. I telegraphed your movements. I knew where you're gonna go, and I was like, "This is, it sucks." And so I don't enjoy watching it. Whereas, like towards the end of the show, I did exactly what what, what Tam had said was like, I would know the words, blah 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 blah, and then I go in there with an incredibly open mind. The fifth and the sixth seasons of my character, and I love, and this will satisfy a lot of community fans. Listen to this and. My favorite seasons as an actor were the last two seasons because I had no idea. I had no expectation. I had no preconceived thought. I, I knew the essence of my character, but I didn't know what, what I would do. And it was a journey of discovery. It's so enjoyable to watch me in those last two seasons because it was just so much. I, I had more fun. I was present. I would like what you're saying, what Tam was saying, be in the moment. I was more in the moment in the latter parts of community and my best acting I've I think I've ever done in my career were in those last two seasons of anything, mm -hmm. including movies like my bad. Well, Ken, yeah, no, yeah. I can't believe I'm a compliment you again, Ken. That's two <laughs> in the same show, but no, no one knew that in those first four years that you were, or the, excuse me, that first season, I, everyone was just like, here comes the scene slayer and he's gonna, I remember Chevy, I was going like, Oh great. Well, here he, now he's just going to steal it all. And I know I was like, like, and I was like, thank God he's funny in the scenes in this comedy <laughs> we're in. Oh, no. I take it as a compliment <laughs> for Jeff. Was... But, but no, there, there is, there is a I, – I think the longer I go in the business is just you, you're doing it. You're trying to achieve some sort of zen, you know, trying to get some sort of peace that you can't find anywhere else. And that's the journey of discovery. So every time I, I look at you and talk to you, it's just about – it's reminding me just, okay – just be zen because you just never know, never know where this leads. And I just have to, I'd be remiss as a wrestling fan to ask you, and I know what your answer is going to be. I just have to ask it because just for me, do you ever, I know you're retired. I know you're retired. <laughs> a lot of people are retired. Ric Flair's retired. Shawn Michaels has retired. They've gone. Everyone in, in the WWE, everyone in wrestling has retired. Terry Funk has retired. <laughs> Do you ever, ever, like, I'm not talking now. I know next year. I know we're going to, five years. Do you ever see a moment, ever, where you could come back in any angle or any, because when Shawn Michaels referee, came back. whatever. Okay. Do you ever, ever imagine in your head, like, a world that could happen? Um, I would go back on the show, like, in a heartbeat. Right. I, I don't disconnect myself from wrestling, because uh, I love it. Yeah, uh, but no, I I want my in ring career is is over. It's over, and because I I would be like I the way I went out was a storybook ending, and I just will not shit on that. <laughs> <laughs> I just won't. I just won't do it. I I just I can. I I just I. Not many wrestlers get to leave this this business on their own terms, and I did, and that is part of my dream um right. so i just i i won't do it a disservice by going back and wrestling again i'd go back and i'd participate i may i may even give somebody a move or something i just won't go back and and be an active in-ring wrestler but i'd like to be on the show i love being a part of, of wrestling i love professional wrestling it's fun it's just fun it's fun yeah Ken, I mean, would you ever do would you ever do Vampire Suck 2, Ken? Oh, yeah. He's talking about this movie I got 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. Not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> one of my early... Uh, I'm, a dick. One, I'm a dick. Vampire Suck like, 2. This guy is such an Spelled T-O-O. <laughs> and uh, Vampire Suck, comma, 2. You know? Uh, I know what didn't suck. The check. Now. But yeah. That's, <laughs> that's a running joke with me and uh, me and Joel. But the, the, yeah. one, the one great perk of hanging out with you, I, I did do a show last year in Clearwater, and mm. it was right in your stomping grounds, and you brought yeah. Titus, and you brought, yeah. um, I'd be remiss to say, I'm, now because of you, I'm friends yeah. with Christian, Edge's partner, yeah. Edge's friend. Yeah. And, and Christian... Maybe like me, we're always kind of like looked at as a sidekicks in our respective fields. And uh, even when I, I posted on Instagram, I, I refused to say it was Christian's name. I said it was Edge's friend. And and he will automatically – he will email me and uh, – he like he's very much similar to Joel. He'll just he's so funny and he's just so he will zing me 
and uh he, he we were texting each other we we're just trading insults uh the other like a year ago and he I don't know what we're doing. And he just said something that he said in the WWE. He goes, you know what? I'm better than you. I'm defeated against the rock in Kentucky. So whatever. That's like, (laughs) (laughs) I'm undefeated against the rock. And so when, when I'm like, I, I bronze that text when, uh, when Christian, so if Christian's listening, I love you, man. And it was, uh, and he's so like, he's, he's got a a future in writing. (laughs) I told him that I I told him he, he shouldn't, I so told witty. him he's got oh. a future in comedy. I, I yeah. told him that he he can act, he can he can write. Yeah. He is so he is so sharp. But um, mm-hmm. but Dave, I just thank you for thank Wait, you. Wait, hold for, on, I have a thing. I got to yeah. ask him something. Yeah. I hope you're not rapping it. Are you rapping? No, don't. I have one more thing. <laughs> Twelve more things. So I did uh, running wild with Bear Grylls last year. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was like, who else has been on it? And he and he we he said Ken Jong, and we just laughed for about ten minutes. <laughs> Uh, but then, <laughs> sorry, Ken, I can't help myself. And Dude, I, uh, it keep, we're no. sharks. These zings keep us alive, man. Uh, <laughs> it's true. Uh, no, but I, he, I was like, who else have you on the show so far? And he was like, Dave Batista. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I was like, how was that? And he paused and he was like, he's just like, that man is so physically strong. It scares me. And <laughs> as we both know, Bear Grylls is the real deal that he's no joke. But then I went and saw, I watched the episode and Ken, I'm not kidding. He just picks up a tree (laughs) and he has like, there's like shots of Juliana Huff, like running away from snakes. And then you have like, uh, where do you want the tree bear? Oh my God, I got to watch it. And and, and then bear even pointed out, he goes like, and I think he was injured. I was like his body, like he was like, (laughs) And he just picked up a fucking tree and then threw it down a cliff and then climbed down the tree. <laughs> the, oh, wow. You know, I, I don't even have a question. I'm just pointing it out. <laughs> I really didn't. I was second. Like, I was wondering if I was going to make it up that tiny little ladder they had at the end of that episode. <laughs> I, I was dying. My hands were on fire. My arms were on fire. And there was a moment where I was like, I'm not going to make this. And I just kept like, going for it. Bear is just like, you know, like, cheering me on. And I finally made it over that cliff. But I, there was a moment where I wasn't sure if I was going to make it over that cliff on that, like, tiny little, I don't know what that ladder was. I mean, I that felt was... like they made it really, really tiny. My foot barely fit into that, you know, onto, into that ladder. They, the but, ladder was the tree, Ken. They, he just made uh, little knocks, knocks in the Lord. tree and then sent it down a yeah. cliff and then they skim, shimmy down this tree. Yeah. But he picked it up with one arm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how great is Bear Grylls? He's okay. the nicest. I love that dude. He's so interesting. I had such a great time on his show. Like he's just yeah. an interesting human being. Like I love sitting down and talking to him, and it's very, very informative. Like who would have thought you could make a uh, fire with a bag of pee? You know, who would have thought? <laughs> Enlighten me. It was because uh, I don't really watch it. He, you can make so, fire with a. He was special so, forces. Kind of like a uh, like a magnifying glass, but they had like a little plastic bag, and they asked me to pee in it. And I was like, "You're kidding?" And they were like, "Nope." <laughs> so I, I peed in this bag, and then they all laughed at me because it was like bright yellow. I was like, "Yeah, you're dehydrated, mate." <laughs> and they, so bear, bear t- <laughs> fills it up with pee, and uh, and then uh, you know just to humiliate me, <laughs> like, "All right, you're." Pee- <laughs> but then they held it into the sun, and they made fire, like, like fire with the. <laughs> A baggie full of pee. (laughs) He's one of those guys when you talk to him, he has, there's nothing you can say like, oh, I remember this really hard time when I went on a hike. And he was like, oh, yeah, I remember when I was, he literally said, I was in North Africa. We took dumps in bags and passed it around to keep our hands warm. And I was just like, well, that's not uh, a normal uh, I, and I have no, I can't top that. that. Like who think? How do you discover that? How does that come about? <laughs> how do we keep our warm? <laughs> he lives on an island that he yeah. owns, and he can he do, does that thing where you strap an engine to your back and you have a parachute. What's I forget what it's called, and that's how he gets to town. And he's like what part of the town council? And I'm not kidding. A jetpack, like a jetpack kind of thing. What is that sport? I don't know. I'm Andrew's- sorry. Uh, it, you, 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 it's basically you, you can power yourself on a parachute. So if you ran off a cliff, you can, okay, you got can it, got it, got it. Zip up, but parasailing, 
Paris. Ah, oh, there you go, Andrew. Yes, Paris sailing. Yes, yes. I, I just did that on Friday, so I, I forgot. I just I, I'm an expert on that. So. Oh, I didn't realize. You were yeah, right. yeah, it's okay. I don't want to. I don't want to talk about me. It's about Dave, but it's. <laughs> uh, it really is, man. I tell you, uh, thank you not only for doing the podcast, but thank you for brightening our day. Because I came in yeah. hot, dude. Before you got on, before you got on the podcast, I I came in hot and uh, just talking to you, just oh man, just puts a big smile on my face, man. And um, uh, just uh, on many levels today, uh, most importantly, just uh, you just uh, I don't know, just just having you here just uh, made me feel happy. So yeah, thank you for, like, for doing this, man. Likewise. Thank you for having me. It's yeah, an honor to meet you, man. And, and, oh, and I, I don't say this too much. I mean, I've never said it to te- uh, uh, Ken, but you're an inspiration, <laughs> Dave. And uh, no, but, uh, uh, your comedic chops, I know they're tremendous because they really upset me. So I uh, just... That's the ultimate compliment. And, yeah. And the act, I mean, just like, uh, thanks for being such a, yeah, normal, wonderful. Yeah, okay, I'm going to stop talking. No, okay. And, uh, but thanks for coming on. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Love to your family, brother. Stay safe. And we'll, uh, yeah. yeah, I'll see you on the other yeah. side when all this yeah. opens up. And I can't wait to, can't wait to see you. So, absolutely. yeah, likewise. All right, yeah. brother. See you guys. Peace. Thanks, Dave. Wow. What uh, a fucking great guy. Fuck. Man, it just doesn't get any better than that. It really doesn't. I mean, I didn't know. I knew he was cool, but holy crap, Ken. He's the best. He's the best. He's the, be- he's the best. He's uh, done he it had, all. He had better acting advice than most of my graduate school. Right? What Literally. he said? I mean, it, 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 it took me five years on community to kind of figure that out to be in the moment. I was so paralyzed with anxiety. Which is the truth. Really? I was. I just Fuck very man. insecure well, about it. And I, I, I really am being totally honest. That never showed. I appreciate. I mean, that. everyone has their thing, but I am not kidding. You can ask Tran. You can. She was like, "Yeah, Ken would stress out before every community <laughs> scene." And then by by the end of the show, I was like, "I got this. Oh I can." I. It, it, you, that's why I love Community so much because that was it. Gave by the end of that series, by the end of the sixth season. I really felt okay. I, I had got confidence in what I do. It took me a long time, and uh, it, it that's why I think community for me is so important because I think Dave is all about finding his journey through whatever he's doing. And I never thought in a million years it would be community. It it just was though. It really it gave me the confidence to move on to projects outside of community. And you know there is something to be said about he was a bouncer. Didn't want to be a wrestler. Yeah. Became a wrestler. Became rejected. Rejected. And then he was WWE champion for a year. He was the face of the show of SmackDown. They had two shows, Raw and SmackDown. And he, what is lost in all of this when people describe his WWE career, he went on. He was the ambassador. He was John Cena. He was the guy yeah. who would go in and he would do the meet and greets for all the fans. He was the face of the company. And then for him to do an abrupt out, about face and go into acting and then to come back on the other side and, and give me what I want, which was like a big mantra um, uh, in, with, with his retirement match with Triple H. He kept saying that. Mm-hmm. And he got it. Well, and he, and he so went out. Could, you guys had similar journeys in that you were like, oh, no, I'm a full fucking doctor. At, you know what? I've done that. I'm now I'm, I'm going to go do I'm going to go do this completely different thing. And boy, one of the funniest moments is when you were like, how much, how did wrestling help acting? He's like, yeah, it did. Dude. But it was <laughs> so interesting. I mean, it was so funny. He's fucking A. That's where his humor comes from when his humor is just so, his comedy is so authentic and totally unforced where he just somehow just, just he just grabbed, he just know he just, he's just grabbed it. So, but even more importantly today, man, he's just, um. He was my Xanax when I needed it, man. I just needed his. I just needed. No, I think it, it just put yeah, me in a good no, mood. I, I can tackle the day today be, because me of him. too, man. I mean, I came into this with that thing on my shoulders, like I fucking angry. a. I was the angry. Country's on fire. Yeah, that was inspirational. I mean, I I just feel like I mean. Want to go to a seminar? 
I know. I, I, I just I feel ready to tackle the day thanks to our our buddy Dave and just thank you for uh for being on and um man, Joel, I just uh he really just brightened up the darkest timeline right now. So yep. uh man, I like I'm so positive right now. I love you, Joel. I love I you. I love you. I love you. I do. Oh. If I could hug you. If Zoom can come up the technology in the next hundred years to hug through a screen, I would do it. Like a three D. You hug. too, Andrew. <laughs> yes. But anyway, uh, love you guys. Thank you for watching. <laughs> I don't know. Is that the worst? That's the Thank worst. Thank you uh, for watching. You sounded like someone's coming up. Yeah. To, like you know what? I'm like happy. You're... It doesn't mean I'll deliver the best outros, but I'm happy. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'll see you at the. I'll see you again real soon, Ken. That was great. <laughs> Thank you was for fun. watching. Thank you for watching. <laughs> <laughs>